I will now pass on to our next contributed presentation of uh, Lucas Heppel on uh, his paper on resource constraint uh, on device learning by dynamic averaging. All right. Uh, Lucas, I just hey. give it to you. Have fun. Can you see me and can you hear me or can you see the slides and hear me? Perfectly. Okay, I'm, great. I'm fine. So I didn't expect to present this live today because I recorded the video, but it was somehow lost. So I'm just going to present it anyway. So, um, yeah, our um, paper is Resource Constraint on Device Learning by Dynamic Averaging. This is a joint work from the MHA Research Center in Germany, Dortmund and Bonn, um, alongside the Monash University and the Fraunhofer EIS. So let's start with the motivation. Um, today, lots of data is generated by physically distributed IoT devices. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see the estimated number of IoT devices in billions during the last and next few years. Um, today, we are around um, 30 billion devices. However, this number is expected to be doubled within the next four to five years. All this data contains lots of valuable information which can be used by machine learning and data analysis algorithms to improve users, but also service provider experience. However, the traditional setting where all the data is centralized to a global cloud does not scale well. Um, here we see a figure with examples for smart devices. For example, we have um, sensors attached to um, smart watches, smart refrigerators, but also in um, smart factories and self-driving cars like we see, like we saw in the first half of this day. Um, now we will have a look at the problems with the traditional approach where all the data is centralized. Um, we have huge problems for storing and transmitting all the data like we saw, for example, what a self-driving car can um, generate on data. On the right hand side, we have another example. This is a mobile, den mobile data generated in Finland during the last few years in billions of gigabytes uh, in millions. Um, and while the data was as low as um, 30, around 30 million gigabytes in 2010, we are now around um, 2000 million gigabytes. So we have a huge increase, which has huge implications for storage and bandwidth. Also, we have um, privacy concerns because most of the data is generated on user devices, which um, have patterns for the user behavior and also some also sensitive data like, I don't know, lots of different stuff. Another disadvantage of the traditional approach is the high energy consumption of the regular hardware. On the right hand side, you can see the TDP and what's for different execution platforms. Um, CPUs are around 65 TDP, while GPUs can range up to 180 watts or even more. And on the other hand side, we have specialized hardware like FPGAs or microcontrollers, which can be as low as 1.5 watts or even less. So our solution to this is we want to apply on-device learning by utilizing the efficient processor processing power and thus to um, process the di data directly on the edge in order to avoid or at least to reduce the bandwidth consumptions. Also, we have different challenges in those resource constraint systems. For example, we have limited processing power or limited instruction sets. Often these processors can don't have a floating point unit or floating pointing instructions use more um, energy than integer arithmetic. And this is also crucial for the next aspect since often these devices are battery powered and therefore we have to be as energy efficient as possible. Another serious limitation are those networks limitations since these devices are often connected via Bluetooth or 3G devices. So the goal for today is to present an energy and communication efficient distributed learning algorithm. As model class, we chose exponential family models because they are quite flexible since they are generative models. So the overall goal of graphical or exponential family modeling is to model uh, the distribution, the joint distribution of some p-dimensional discrete random vector. And we do this by exploiting independencies between the individual components on the right, uh, between the individual components for a compact representation. This representation is captured by a graph and on the right hand side, you can see a small example for the dependency structure between the random variables. The density is denoted as follows. 
So the probability for one assignment is just exponential function of some inner product of some sufficient statistic phi, which maps the uh, assignment to some one hot or to multiple one hot encoded vectors together with some parameter vector from the real numbers. And this is divided by our normalizer. However, regular exponential family models cannot be evaluated on integer hardware, and thus we have to adapt those. The first thing is to restrict the parameter space to be a subset of the natural numbers, which are less than a specified num uh, number k. This allows us to store one parameter by log two of k bits. Um, by doing this, um, this uh, um, allows us to, or uh, this ensures its inner product results also in a nat natural number, which together with changing the base from e to two allows us to evaluate the upper part of the fraction as um, bit shift. Also, we don't store the probabilities as floating points, but instead we store the potential and the normalizer, and we are still able to compare different probabilities to each other. Um, for learning, suppose that we are given some data set of n examples, then we just use the regular uh, maximum likelihood approach and we solve this to find our optimal parameter. One great thing about um, exponential family models is that we can summarize the whole data set within just one average vector, which is just the average of the sufficient statistics for each of the samples of our data sets. Afterwards, we can solve the following optimization problem and we are able to do this using specialized integer algorithms. Um, yeah. We also can apply this as iterative learning by updating those moves as running average, and then we just solve the problem for the specific mu at our time point t. Now we, I will introduce the distributed machine learning setup. We suppose that we have a set of M learners which are connected to some global coordinator we have some data generating distribution and we follow some online round-based learning process where in each round all of the learners receive some samples are required to make some predictions and update their model. And our overall goal is to find a global optimal model which performs nice on all of the nodes. So in order to find our model, we want to answer the following questions. Um, what do we communicate? When do we communicate? And how do we merge those informations together? So the first step is what do we communicate? Um, we evaluated three different options. The first one is a centralized approach where all of the individual learners maintain a local data summary, which is then transmitted to a global coordinator, which then aggregates those data summaries, fits the model on those and redistributes the model. The great thing about this approach is that we can um, transmit the complete data sets to our coordinator by just sending um, as much data summaries as we have learners. And so all models get all information from all others. However, in this approach, while we do, if we don't send our data summaries and get a new model, we won't um, update our local models and thus we won't um, adapt to new data. And we also transmit privacy preserving data. The second approach is the naive averaging, where the local models maintain the data summaries, one an optimization algorithm to maintain a local parameter vector theta, and both values are sent to a coordinator which aggregates both of the, those and sends the uh, um, averages back to each of the nodes. However, like I mentioned in the introduction, we, um, the data often contains privacy pre, um, sensitive information. And thus we also propose just the privacy preserving averaging where we just send the raw parameter vectors, aggregate those and redistribute them. I also prepared an example um, for the number of communication which we need for one round for the different approaches with regular and integer exponential family models. Assuming we have 16 learners, the problem dimension of 1000, and we use single precision for the regular exponential family and three bit for the integer ones, we get a reduction in communication by a factor of 10 for the privacy preserving approach, while the others are as little as 2.5. Um, the next step is to answer the question, when do we communicate? The most forward um, approach to tackle this problem is to apply periodic synchronization where we transmit the changes in the data summaries or parameter vectors as soon as we um, as new data arrives. 
However, this has also huge implications on the bandwidth if um, data if new samples arrive um, in really in a high frequency. And thus, we introduce a hyperparameter B, which allows us to control the frequency, and therefore we can reduce the communication. Um, however, we can do better by applying dynamic synchronization, and there we synchronize in a data-driven way. Therefore, we define some reference vector R, which is um, a d-dimensional vector from the natural numbers, also a divergence threshold, and we only transmit if the, dis if the squared distance between those two vectors is larger than our um, threshold. Um, as reference vector, we usually use a global model, and therefore we only um, transmit if those mo if the local model um, diverges from our global model. Notice that since we are using the squared distance and everything is from the natural numbers, we also we can also evaluate each of these equations using integer-only arithmetic. The last step is the model aggregation. So. Um, we will, in this work, we will focus on the simple average because this has been shown that this performs well in other works like federated averaging, for example. However, um, averaging two integers does not necessarily yield an other <laughs> integer, and therefore we propose to calculate the flawed average, which can be calculated also using integer-only arithmetic by summing up all the individual values and then doing a bit shift by the specified number. Also, we can apply hierarchical reduction to prevent overflows during summations. Um, by using all these approximation techniques, we are um, introducing different approximation errors. For example, by using the, we are approximating the regular exponential family by using integer exponent, exponential families. However, Nico Piatkowski showed that this error is bounded. Also, Michael showed that the error of dynamic averaging is bounded in, um, depends on periodic averaging. And we also showed, or it's easy to show that the distance between the flawed and the true average is also bounded by the square root of the dimension. Overall, we showed that the combined error for these approaches is also bounded. And if you want to see more details, you can have a look at our paper. So now we will have a look at the experimental evaluation. We want to answer the following questions. For example, how does periodic averaging compare to dynamic averaging in combination with regular and integer exponential family models? How do the different communication schemes compare to each other? And specifically, we want to answer um, those questions with respect to the following criteria. What's the model quality? What are the bandwidth savings? And what are the resulting energy savings? So as general setup for the experimental evaluation, we simulated a distributed learning environment using 16 clients. Therefore, we also use uh, a distributed learning platform, which was promoted by Peter in the first talk. The graph structure was estimated on some whole data set and the integer learner parameter space was, was, was restricted to the natural numbers, which are less than eight. This allows us to store each parameter by using just three bits. The remaining data was partitioned horizontally among the, all of the nodes, and we evaluated the system performance using the cumulative zero one loss average across all learners and time slots. One round um, was based um, on the following procedure. Each uh, learner received a batch of data, um, they were asked to predict the labels for the batch, afterwards computed the predictive performance. Thereafter, there, the data summaries were updated and the optimization algorithm was run for a given budget. Note that this allows for a further trade-off between battery life of a device and model quality. In the end, the, mod, the learners communicated um, with the coordinator depending on the protocol chosen. So here we have um, the results for specific data sets comparing the three different communication schemes. And at the moment, we are only having a look at the resource constraint averaging parts. On the y-axis, you can see the misclassification rate, while on the x-axis, you can see the communication and bytes. On the left-hand side, you see the centralized approach where you see that using less communication, we receive a worse model. If we have a look at, at the naive averaging, we cannot see any clear pattern. 
um, some words of dynamic averaging are better than our baseline and some are worse. The same holds for the periodic averaging. The baseline was just the uh, average error while not communicating at all. If we have a look at the privacy preserving averaging, we, however, we see a different pattern. Um, the, least the periodic averaging approaches are almost often worse than our baseline. They denoted with a red circle. The reason for this might be that rounding too often or rounding at fixed intervals, the optimization progress gets negated since we only have integer solutions. If we, on the other hand, if we look at the dynamic averaging, which are denoted by the stars, we see that most of them are better than our baseline and using less and less communication, we converge towards our baseline. If we compare the different approaches in terms of communication, we see that nice solutions for the centralized approach required um, around 10 to the power of seven bytes. The naive averaging was between 10 to the power of six and 10 to the power of seven while the privacy preserving averaging used as little as 10 to the power of five. So all in all, we can say that the privacy aware averaging retains the performance while using less bandwidth than the other approaches. If we compare this now to um, the non-resource constraint models, we see that um, we have a slight drop in predictive performance, like around 3% accuracy. However, we save lots of communication and we have the um, additional advantage of being able to use ultra low power devices which are really cheap and yeah so all in all we can say that we have a slight drop in accuracy however we can save energy and communication this work also opens up lots of future work for example we want to scale the number of learners to see the effects for example for the rounding but also using the dynamic averaging, we can apply specialized techniques like partial aggregation to reduce the communication even further, which might be even better with using um, more and more learners. We also want to um, further have a look into the communication versus bonding impact, especially for the periodic averaging. Also, we need uh, methods to select optimal hyperparameters like the delta because it, sometimes it was quite hard to find an optimal choice because since we have only integer solutions, we had huge changes in the norm. Another different work could be the modular parameter updates because our global parameter vector is just a concatenation of individual subsets for each click of the graph. And this could or might, might be also extended to an approach where we um, have different model structures and different nodes. So we can model slightly different distributions and we might be still able to match those based on the clicks. Further work could be the adaptation to non-IID or time variant data sets. So all in all, we showed that distributed um, integer only learning of, of integer exponential family models is possible. However, in resource constrained machine learning, we always have an inherent energy versus performance trade-off. For the best data set, I think we had a bandwidth reduction of a factor of almost 200 and we had an estimated energy reduction of factor 67. However, this was just with some crude assumptions for the energy and for the number of operations we had to do. Maybe we want to do this on some real hardware in the future to see what's real en um, energy reduction. Thanks for your attention and I'm open for your questions now. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Uh, we now have the time for questions, so... Uh, that's the moment to raise your hand in the chat. I might start uh, again with, with rather a general question as well as I had for the um, blockchains because again, I was working a lot with trying to distribute deep learning together with Michael, but uh, I was now working with um, uh, probability families. This, um, and I wanted to ask, I guess, like um, this whole idea of approximating the distribution directly, what is your feeling? Is it uh, easier to do it this way or using some models like uh, again, like SVM or kernel methods or something like this. I know it's not about distributions, a question, but I'm just interested in all this 
novel methods. That's why the question is like this. Um, so you mean the, if we have a distribution instead of just using some approach which just gives predictions instead of exactly exactly like what what is more complicated uh, what is more affordable I think that using those models might be a little bit more complicated since you are always modeling at least if you don't use conditional random fields or stuff like this then you are modeling the joint probability instead of just the conditional probability distribution and however, we have some advantages like having maybe uncertainty estimates, uncertainty estimates, which can be used if you don't need a point estimate, but you want to be sure if your prediction is correct. I'm not sure if each of the other methods can provide you something like this. And this is a great thing about the probabilistic models. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. But uh, I mean, for me, the, the main stopper in front of all the probabilistic methods was always that you have to have an idea how your probability looks like, right? So you have to know what parameters you're trying to learn. And in case when it's extremely complicated and you have all these various parameters, it might become even uh, harder than learning the uh, not conditional probability, but this yeah, I think the main problem here is that you, um, the probability distribution is encoded by the graph structure and you have to know the graph structure beforehand because otherwise exactly. the averaging is not applicable at the moment and yep. therefore I also thought of using maybe some iteratively refitting of the structure based on local samples and then try maybe try to match the parameters between different nodes. However, I did not try anything on this, and these are just some um, ideas I am adding at the moment. But I think overall, it's like the hardest problem of probabilistic models that learning structure is actually not not answered question basically yet. Yeah, there are some approaches, but maybe you can also have some domain knowledge if you have an expert, which says maybe that the dependencies between those sensors, then yeah. you are good. Yeah. But it's never the case, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe you can get some feedback from an expert if you use some method and apply it to um, get some initial structure and then he can say, this makes sense, maybe delete those and there's no depends. But yeah, yeah it's really hard to have the, a basic idea of the optimal structure for the problems. Right, more questions. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, beautiful talk, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I was just uh, wondering about this uh, reference vector. Uh, yeah. I think you have to go six or seven slides mm -hmm. back. Oh, uh, that one, that one. Can you say something about this R vector and mm -hmm. uh, how mm -hmm. you choose it, etc.? Yes, yes. Yeah, of course. Um, the R vector is just, in the beginning, is just our initialized, um, our initial solution, our in initial guess. And as soon as um, some learners um, diverge too much from our local model, okay, okay. then we just average those at the coordinator and the coordinator will redistribute the current global mean model to all of those. And with the partial aggregation, you also can only consider subsets to further reduce communication. Okay. Um, and have you in this regard um, studied the question of what happens if uh, everybody is content with uh, its model, it did not change, but the global model may still change. Have you looked at that danger, quote mark? Um, can, you can you repeat, um, please? Yes. Um, what you're doing, if I understand correctly, is looking at the local model, right? Yeah, exactly. So the setter, the setter and, here is one local model. Okay, and uh, so I, I would, maybe we should take this offline, but I would like to talk with you guys and see what happens. Um, um, there's this danger that the local models remain the same, but the global model changes. But, so I would like to correspond with you guys and, and discuss it. That's one question, but we will take it offline <laughs> because it's kind of technical. And another one, can you explain the, the, uh, the emphasis on, uh, on integer, on integer programming? Is this done because of uh, bandwidth consider considerations? Or, or um, I, yeah, I, we, I, have, I, we have different advantages. 
Okay. For example, like the chip, like this one on the right hand side, they are really cheap in contrast to some other chips. So you can employ those models much simply if you have really lots of devices and then in production you will save maybe a few thousands, millions, whatever. Oh, I don't okay. know. Okay. And another advantage is that we can select the number of bits for each parameter by this number K. And you, so you can select somehow what the communication complexity. But it also depends, based on this choice, the model quality might be worse or better. Mm -hmm. For okay. our choice, using three bits, so we had eight different values for each parameter, resulted in an okay approximation to the real um, exponential family. Okay, good. So, so it is a, a, with regard to value. Okay, okay. Thanks a and lot. Not only, right? I mean, in principle, okay. it means you can run it on a, on a processor that has no floating point capabilities. Uh -huh, okay. Exactly. That's and the this point. is important because you have these really, really cheap processors which are everywhere. Okay, good. 